Like, is there really a well thought out strategy that will encourage people to come and stay and become part of the process of a community? In education, is there an entry point that you've thought about that you open up so that people can come in? Yaqub said, Right, go in. So as educators, and I worry, uh, about five years ago, I was teaching a, a classical text in Irvine, California. So, you know, I have to give it the Irvine vibe, you know, it's Irvine. And uh, afterwards, a young student uh, from uh, institution, religious institution, came to me and he's like, you know, I just, don't really, I just don't appreciate how you teach people. I was like, mashallah, thanks man, how old are you? He's like, I'm 20. It's like, mashallah. So I said, why? He said, you know, people need to come to us. Like, people should climb the mountain, man. So I said to him, what if their legs are broke? He's like, what, you, what if they have gangrene? What if they can't climb that, that mountain that Allah blessed you to climb, man? So then what will you do? And then he didn't have an answer. So I believe we really need to invest Educationally in entry points for people. So we'll start with one inshallah. We'll just read a little bit then tomorrow we'll continue. So the first chapter is very interesting, very important. And Sheikh Ahmad Dardir, what he wanted to do with this book is encapsulate those things which we have to believe. And he represents one school of Sunni theology. There's three major schools of Sunni theology throughout our history. And, and these schools they're all basically going to take you to uh, San Francisco. But some are going to take 280, some are going to take 101, some went to Oakland and went across the bridge. But you still got where? You still got to Oakland, uh, to San Francisco. And Sunni theology at its core tries to do two very remarkable things that people should think about. The first is it tries to enhance our respect and acknowledgement of Allah's transcendence, of our Tawheed. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ So Sunni theology, and we live now, there's a great book out called The Domestication of Transcendence. It's a very powerful book. It talks about how language, now you have like, that guy's a god, dude. No, he's not. The domestication of the idea of transcendence undermines uh, the jalal of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the ulu of Allah. So Sunni theologians, regardless of their, their madrasa that they came from, one of their major focuses was on preserving the sanctity and sacredness of God. Even the malaika, لك, they immediately acknowledge the fact like, hey, we recognize your transcendence. The second thing, and this is what makes it remarkable, is that they try to reinforce the notion that having a viable, meaningful, consistent relationship with God is possible. So what we call this in mantiq is ijtima'u naqidain. Ijtima'u naqidain. You brought together two opposite components. Allah is transcendence, God is close to you. Allah is unlike anything we know, but God has your back. And that was the challenge of Sunni theology. And the Shaykh, he represents a school that's unique for a number of reasons. Does, I'm not saying it's the best, it's not my job. I, don't, I really don't worry about these kind of things. Man. And that is that this school primarily, as most of the early Islamic sciences, blossomed in a multicultural society, where in fact, Muslims in their numbers were still a minority. So like if you read al Munqid, I was reading al Munqid min al-Dalala today of Imam al-Ghazali on the plane. Figure if you can read anything on the plane after Quran, <laughs> read being saved from this guidance, you know? Literally. Um, and Imam al-Ghazali says something very interesting in the introduction. He says, you know, when I, when I, when I you know, grew up as a child, لحثت أولاد النصارى وأولاد اليهود وأولاد المجوش. He said, you know, as I grew up as a child, 
I notice Jewish children and Christian children and Magian children. What does it tell you about the neighborhood of Imam al-Ghazali? Like, go to a deeper reading. That means that Imam al-Ghazali lived in a multicultural society. He was surrounded by people who weren't just Muslim. He was surrounded by people from all kinds of backgrounds. Now, if you think about that, then it becomes extremely interesting to note that you're studying a form of Sunni theology that in its infancy, and as it blossomed, especially in Iraq and in Egypt, full stop, at that time, and in Damascus, its primary engagement was with who people of different religious traditions and backgrounds. If you take that and think about where you are now in America, by no means is the Bay Area monolithic when it comes to religion. So I feel that at times this approach for theology is fitting because its growth comes through some very similar circumstances that we may find ourselves in today. And because of that, the way they teach is different. And I'm going to try to explain that to you as we go through the text, inshallah. So he begins and he says the first obligation. He says, يَجِبُوا عَلَى الْمُكَلَّفِ He said the first obligation upon a mukallaf, an obligation, of course, is something that if we do it with intention, we're rewarded. If we don't do it, uh, we may be in trouble. مَا يُثَابُ عَلَى فَعْلِهِ وَقَدْ يُعَاقَبُ عَلَى تَرْكِهِ As Imam al-Haramay says. So it's like an obligation. We learn something from the text that early teachers had priorities in teaching people. Imam Sidi Ahmad Zarouq, he says in Al-Qawaid, he said, تَقْدِيمُ uh, الْأَهَمَ عَلَى الْمُهِمْ شَأْءُ الصَّارِكِينَ فِي كُلِّ شَيْءٍ He said, you know, understanding what's truly important is the, the constant case of the seeker. They understand priorities. So the Sheikh, he doesn't start with like differences I remember I, I, I lived here, and I remember one time uh, one group came and taught Aqidah. There's a weekend course here, and my phone started blowing up, you know. All kind of questions from, from some of our older, older community who never heard these things before. It's okay, it's okay, don't worry, that's you know, part of our tradition. And then the next week, the complete opposite of that madrasa came and taught Aqidah. Two weeks later, it was like they were going back and forth, like trying to take over MCA, man. And I remember after two weeks of both courses, I had a dear auntie, mashallah, she's over 70, so she gets the auntie, you know, designation with ijlal and ihtiram, you know. She said to me, I think I left Islam. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, you're 70 years old, like, mashallah. How could you have left? Well, I was the first week, I agreed with what they were saying, but the next week, I found out what I agreed with was wrong. I don't know if I'm still Muslim. So then I, I talked to the brothers at that time who were in charge of the, the, what is it, the education committee here. And I said like, is this really what you want to see happen to the community? Like 70 year old people wondering if they're still Muslim? And then the brother told me, I didn't know, I didn't even attend either of the events. SubhanAllah, why are you putting on an event you didn't even go to, man? So the Sheikh teaches us something. And to be honest with you, those issues that she had concerns with are not even from the fundamentals of theology. They're secondary issues. Imam Subki said, all of my students succeeded who started their relationship with foundations, foundational learning. But the ego doesn't like to hear that, man. Like, what are you learning? Oh, I'm just learning the basics. Nobody wants to say that. We want to say, like, I'm studying this, I'm studying that, I'm studying this hardcore book, blah, blah, blah. When I was in Egypt, I remember a brother came from America. And this brother, subhanAllah, he had not studied before. And I met him at the Azhar. I said, hey man, how are you? Oh, I'm tamam, alhamdulillah. I said, what are you studying? He said, I'm studying Anwar al-Buruq, which is a book of Imam al-Qarafi. It's four volumes. It's hard, man. He said to me, what about you? I said, yeah, they told me in four years I can study that book you study, and now you've been here four weeks. This brother left Islam. Not because of Qarafi, but if you try to go into the deep end, man, and you don't know how to swim, you're going to sink. 
And if there's ego in the knowledge, I've seen this in my own mistakes in my own life. When there's ego in something I set out to do when it comes to religious knowledge, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't bring fruit. It doesn't bring fruit. So we learn something from Sheikh Ahmad Dardir. Priorities. Ask yourself right now, what are the top four priorities in your life? We don't even like to think about it. My father is 80 years old. I said to him, what are the top three priorities of your life? He said, I'm too old to have priorities. I said, what does that mean? <laughs> I'm too young then. I said, no. But have you thought about how you want to die? Shouldn't that be kind of like number one on your list, bro? Just take like 10, 15 seconds. Let's follow the example of this sheikh who begins with priorities. You know why a lot of people are upset inside, man? And they feel a lot of frustration inside? They don't have priorities. Sayyidina Ali, alayhi salam, he said there are some people, they're like branches. Wherever the wind blows, they just go with the wind. He said, but the believer is also thabit. They have priorities. One of my teachers, he said, you'll truly become a student of knowledge when you're able to say, I can't study that right now. Because you know, when you first go, I want to study this, I want to study that, I want to study this, I want to study that. You want to study everything. It's like when you go in the gym, you do like full body workouts. He's like, but when you're able to identify what you can't study because of priorities, then you become a student. So take like 20 seconds, that little voice inside us that we hate to talk to, and ask that voice like, what are the three or four most important priorities in your life? So that's what the Shaykh he does. He teaches us awlawiyat. So he says, yajibu al mukallaf. It's a big statement, man. And yajib means it's constantly an obligation. He's, he's alluding to something. It's not like an obligation once. It's not an obligation twice. It's not an obligation like for a weekend. It's constant. This obligation is constant. It never leaves you. It always stays with you. It will always be there with you. Imam Shafi'i, he said about this obligation, it, it will appear when you need it, whether you recognize it or not. So he says, Yajibu al mukallafi. What do you think that first obligation is? Huh? Okay. Who else? First obligation is Islam. This is agreed upon by 85% of Sunni scholars. Majority. First obligation. Salah. Salah. No. But it's a good try. You're close. Huh? Like being honest. Almost. Tawheed. Almost. They say. All of those things are the tijit of this fard. All those things that you're missing are the outcome of this. They, it, they can't happen without it. This becomes really important. I teach in NYU with Imam Khaled Latif, who's like, you should invite him, he's freaking amazing, man. And I get this question, especially when Bill Maher was like attacking Islam, uh, saying Islam is a motherload of bad ideas, Islam is anti-rational. Islam, of course, disciplines rational, rationale, but it's not anti-rational. Mother of bad ideas, anti-intellectual. He says, يجب على المكلف معرفة. And the first obligation is to know. Everybody like got quiet. Everybody froze, man. First obligation is to know. That's your deen. Now, let's take that to a personal level. Like, how often am I like, Learning, you know, at least once a week, maybe listening to a podcast, maybe attending halaqa, whatever I can do, reading a book. But then let's take this also to an institutional level. How would that play out as a policy? 
If we believe this is fard ayn and fard kifaya, that means learning is individual and communal. So that means I have to be facilitating the opportunity for people to ask questions, to engage, to learn, to study, to challenge. And he uses the word ma'rifah. And that's important. The word ma'rifah is from the word arf. If you have the book, tomorrow inshallah you can take notes. We made like super huge margins for you. Ma'rifa means to follow. Arf al faras is the mane of the horse. Because when you see the mane, you follow it. Oh, this is the horse. So the ma'rifa of Allah is that we learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We learn about certain qualities that we have learned from prophets and sacred texts about God. And then we couple that with our experiences in life. That's why he doesn't say ilmu. He says ma'rifa, because ma'rifa is the joining of two things, learning rules and principles, learning orthodoxy, and living it, and experiencing it, and synthesizing that together. That's why the other word for ma'rifa, ma'rifa is always a word, arf always means yadullu ala that shay, or ala mahir shay, something that tells you about something else. So they call the peaks of a mountain arf al-jibal. Surah to what? Seven chapters of the Quran is called what? Surah A'raf. Also something that smells nice is called Arf. Arf al-Nashir. Like a dog. I tell my students, say Arf, 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 Arf. Like a dog. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, Arf. It's easy. Little kids can remember. Don't ask about dogs. And subhanAllah, I'll give you a nice example of what I mean. Marrying a cognitive engagement with a physical engagement. This would flip Eric Erickson you know, in his grave. And that is, if you wake up in the morning, you know, and you know that your husband has cooked for you some incredible meal. You say to yourself, wow, did my husband make aloo parata? Oh, wow, he knows that's my favorite. Wait, is it kima parata? Is it asif? Is it Halal turkey bacon and eggs and biscuits if you're from Oklahoma. So you're smelling it araf too. Because the outcome of araf is hukum. And that hukum is called ma'rifah. Wujudi shay aw adam wujudi. Either I'm going to affirm it or deny it. So I'm smelling, I'm smelling, I'm smelling, I'm smelling. Then as I get to the kitchen, man, Rice Krispies. Right, so, but that moment of man, that's called ma'rifa. The sheikh is saying, the first obligation upon a believer is to do what they need to do to have that moment with God, to follow God. So, acquiring lenses by which we see our world, because we are in a world now, and this is something I think as Muslims we should talk about, the, con the intellectual constructions which formulate the goggles by which we look at the world can at times be problematic. And perhaps also we learn from religious folks things which also may be problematic. So we would have to trust in God for this process. But he said the first obligation is Ma'rifa. This book tries to attempt and has done so the first half of the equation. How do you think about God? How do you think about prophets? How do you think about angels? How do you think about the hereafter? It does something very different. It doesn't get into all the arguments because remember this book was, the style of teaching, excuse me, not necessarily this text, was uh, constructed in a time where they were engaging non-Muslims. So you don't want to start with non-Muslims and be like, you know, this hadith is weak and you can't use this term and that term's wrong, blah, 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 but what? And also it wanted to do something which Islamic theology does, and this is the third goal of Islamic theology that I waited to tell you till now. He said the first is to recognize God's transcendence, the second is to have a relationship with God, and the third, and this is something that we need to work on, is prepare us for public life, to prepare us for engagement. 
And I would say in America, large percentage of Muslim communities are not thinking about strategic engagement. They're thinking about strategic incubation and just hoping I can make it. But that's not how it works. He says something else when we finish, inshallah. He uses the word mukallaf. The word mukallaf means someone that's burdened. And this brings about something that we struggle with as Muslims because we have to be honest. Uh, I think American Muslims in many ways have been infected by a Protestant message of the gospel of prosperity. We may not admit it, but it permeates America. American greatness is tied to God's happiness. Whereas our theology says, you may be great and God could hate you. You may be mo the most successful human being on the face of the earth and God is angry with you. And you may be the poorest human being on the face of the earth and Allah loves you. The, the tethering of theology to material success is one of the greatest challenges of this age. And Muslims aren't free of it. That's why I said, if you go look at, I would say 90% of the boards across this country and our nonprofits, they're all rich people. Whereas you may have some faqir, you may have somebody who's not that rich, but they know a lot about their craft and they're in the masjid regularly and they understand the policies of masjid. They will never have the opportunity to, to be part of the community. What does that tell you about the community? Whereas the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the khutbah early on, first moments of his message, a woman, a slave, a rich man, and a youth. Every demographic of Mecca is with the Prophet, the beginning of his message, because he's for the people, not just for one group of people. But that notion, and you see sometimes Muslims will say, you know, I'm sick, God must hate me. No, he doesn't. The challenge of paradox. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said in the famous hadith of Jibreel, to believe in Allah, his angels, his books, his messengers, then he does something called tawqeed lafli, wa tu'mina bil qadri. And to believe that whatever happens is from God, he emphasizes the verb. Because people, even Taymiyyah said, are going to have problems with qada. So before we talk about being mukallaf, there's one thing I need to say, and that is, it is crucial that if we are going to think about Islamic theology in America critically, then we have to emancipate it from the clutches of white supremacy. And we have to emancipate it from different cultural groups within the Muslim community. Theology is not a culture. Theology is doing our best to believe and speak about God in truth. And that truth refuses to accept white supremacy. That, proof, that truth refuses to accept MQM and People's Party. That truth refuses to accept Pan-Arabism. It can't. Because theology in its essence is for God. And that's why I'm going to say something and may challenge you. The first step to emancipating our faith is to stop trying to speak in the language of faith using the language of the secular. Because when we use the language of the secular, we subject our faith to a logic which faith doesn't align with. And I'll give you some examples. You'll be like, it's so weird. And that's why we say, that belief in God, in its very essence, is an example of super irrationality. People do not like to hear that. You can say super rationality, I just want to mess with you. Super irrationality. I, I, I taught this to some college students at NYU. This girl, she raised her hand and she's like, it's just like so refreshing. I can just tell these people, look, man. Part of faith is the acceptance of the irrational. Ma salama. 
instead of trying to box faith in and use a dialectic which wasn't constructed for faith in the first place and then wonder why I can't bang with these people. I can't, I can't jump out of the ring. I gotta tap out because you've boxed it into some constructions that aren't made to engage faith in the first place. What do I mean? Here's something you should try. Ask someone who is submitted to, quote unquote, the dominant rationale of America. James Cone says, anything rational is subservient to something more powerful than it. That's the reality. Rationale tends to be dictated by people who have money and have access and can be the loudest in a society. That's how it works. That's why the prophet was called Majnun. You're not rational. But let's invert it. Let me show you what I mean. Let's take a, a, a simple post-enlightenment attitude, post-modern attitude, if you will, and apply that to a man who says, I was with my wife one night in the desert, and we needed some fire. So I saw this fire. I went to this tree and started talking. I said, you're a prophet. What would be the highly westernized rationale analysis of Musa. He's, he's nuts. Now you see how crazy it is. We're trying to do that with religion, but the other way around. We're trying to speak through faith and subject the secular to face rationale. It doesn't work. So the simple thing is to say, we just don't agree on this. And we emancipate our theology to speak for itself and to act as a cleansing agent in society, instead of always being boxed in. I teach a class at NYU called Islamic Law and Ethics. The original curriculum they gave me was like, why we're not terrorists? Why we don't hate women? Why this? I said, I'm not teaching this. I'm not gonna subject myself to your narrative. So they said, okay, what are you gonna teach? I said, from the Jenners to Jannah, Islam and bioethics. Jenners to Jannah, plastic surgery. Bioethics. And they're like, Islam talks about bioethics. I was like, yeah. The other class we did, from DJ Khaled to Imam Khaled, is Islam a monolithic culture? Our Shia scholar did Karabella and Black Lives Matter. And they were like, you know, we never knew that Islam could speak to the age. I said, because you never challenged it to. And, and, and maybe the way we taught it, we packed it nicely into the lunchbox of the dominant narratives of society. So before we start, there's one thing I want us to think about, emancipating our theology and allowing it to speak for itself. And the best way that that happens, as Ustad Khurram Murad Rahimahullah mentions, is to read the Quran as sincerely as you can and without going to one extreme or the other. Sheikh, he says, يجب على المكلف The mukallaf is someone who's burdened. Paradox. I remember when I became Muslim, man, they were like, Islam is so fun, it's so amazing, so awesome. I was like, really? Yeah, they're like, so tomorrow at 5.45 in the morning, you have to wake up. I was like, I thought you said it was fun. <laughs> the paradox. But there are things that Allah has burdened us with which we may struggle to like. That's acceptable in our theology. That's part of our theology. And the mukallaf is the person who's burdened, and there's four conditions I'm gonna mention and we'll stop. Number one is that someone should be physically mature. This is very important. They have the physical ability to perform the act. Number two, Maturation, mental maturation, the ability to understand, to understand moral ideas, to understand notions of philosophy. We say that if one of those is missing, and this is important because sometimes parents, this is a parents' teens edition, they come to me and they're like, you know, Lil Abdullah is so smart, but he just can't stand. He's like, you know, he's not strong, he can't fast. So we call this taklif naqis. Taklif naqis. Half is there, half isn't there. So we're merciful to that person. We don't burden them. On the other end, maybe somebody is physically strong and still very immature. 
not able to conceptualize what God is asking, we say also this is called taklif naqis, a deficient form of responsibility. That's important because I get this question all the time from people. My son is like physically very strong, my daughter is like mashallah very tall, but you know, they have some challenges in understanding certain things. This is called taklif naqis. You can extend this to other issues that we'll get in a second as before we finish. The, set, the third condition, which also is extremely important, is that a person, and no one talks about this, has good emotional and psychological health. This is found in our texts. Pain is lifted from three people. And I'll give you an example. I was in a community, it wasn't this community, I have to say that. And there was a, an amazing sister, a convert sister, mashallah, who I used to see her after salah, she would stay in dhikr for like an hour, man. I was like, wow, mashallah, man, I'm so bad. And she was a student at a very, very prominent university. But then one day I saw her crying. So initially I thought like, wow, mashallah, she's crying, like, whoa. But then I heard the cries of pain, not like the cries of khushu. So I said to her, hey, Salaam Alaikum, I'm sorry. what's going on? She's like, I don't know, am I on, am I on 23 or 25, man? I was like, what do you mean? She's like, I, I have a compulsive issue. I was like, you don't sit here every day because like, you're from the awliya of Allah. And she's like, no, man, I sit here because I'm not sure how many I counted. So this is someone that has a challenge Cognitive challenge. We talk about old people who have Alzheimer's. Nisyan is from the Mashaqqat. Right? I have people calling me saying, you know, my father and my mother has Alzheimer's. My father just prayed like 45 rakat for Maghrib, for example. Or you prayed like one rakat. I'm like, it's okay, khalas yani. Because we believe that if these ideas of taklif are challenged, then people should be experiencing dispensation. The Maliki Madhab. We, we differ strongly with the Shafis. We say that maharuni al qalb. You know, you're not allowed to say your intention before prayer. You know, in Malaysia, pray in Malaysia, like, Uridu an nusalli arba rakat lillahi ta'ala Allahu akbar. MashaAllah, it's beautiful. Malikis were like, what was that? You know, we're very quiet. But you find Imam Khalil, this great Maliki jurist, said, except if someone needs help remembering what they're doing. So in that situation, it's commendable. How can we take this idea of taklif and start to think about how do we educate children in Islamic studies who have learning challenges? It's not even on the radar. What kind of programming do we have for converts or for adults who may have certain cognitive challenges or psychological challenges or health challenges. I'll give an example. I'm on the Fit Council of North America. It's really cool. I don't do anything as much as smart people. I just listen to what they say. But there was a sister. She came to me. She was a young sister. And she said to me, and she was weak. And I said, what's wrong? She said, Imam, I have been fasting for five days straight without stopping. I was like, what? And she said to me, I have chronic anorexia, man. When I was little, my mother beat me because she said I wasn't cute and made me look at myself in the mirror. So when I fast, I can't stop. So I said, are you in therapy? She's like, alhamdulillah. I was like, what is your therapist saying? Therapist is saying I shouldn't fast. Drink some water. What, what, what would make us make this dispensation is that her taklif is naqis. So how do we serve instead of like embarrassing? And mashallah, I, I remember this is one of the first communities I've ever seen that had a mentorship program for people and had like proper mental health support services. Like Allah bless this community, man. First, I learned that from this community. Wherever I go, I'm like, yo, you've got to have clinicians, have to have partnerships with clinicians, need to be serving the real needs of the people. Imams should not be counseling people or doing this because we're not trained. We need counselors ourselves. 
But if we were to unpack the idea of taklif here in the text and expand it, we can give people hope who are struggling, right? We can think about creating much more nuanced and caring services for our community. And then number three, we challenge ourselves to think very differently about our religion. But when we learn taklif, we just learn this, 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 okay, inshallah. But the emotional health of people is kept into consideration. That's why the Quran, you have two qira'ah, don't want to make it complicated for people. Asabahum al-qar, asabahum al-qar, wal-qur, wal-qar. Qar means they were affected by some external problem. Qur means an uhud, internal emotional trauma. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, ثُمَّ أَنزَلَ عَلَيْكُمُ sakina." Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed this from you and gave you sakina, نُثَبِّتُهُ بِهِ fu'adak. The last and we'll stop insha'Allah condition of taklif is that you heard the message properly. Husbands, don't take this and run with it, man. I know how we do. I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you. I didn't hear that. Right, that's how we get out of trouble. And kids also, I didn't hear that. No, this is not a license to get me in trouble with your parents or your spouse. But Qadi Abu Bakr, even Arabi, he's a great scholar. He's also hilarious. Student of Al-Ghazali, great Maliki jurist from Andalus. He said, you know, People have had to heard the message. And this takes us to a question that I think I get by more young people. This is the third most common question I get from them. The salvation of people who never heard about Islam. They ask them about this question all the time. And it's not necessarily that they have doubts. They, they have friends. Their friends ask them, like, so am I going to hell? Right? I'm your best friend. You going to hell? We played Fortnite together, dude. Go to hell. <laughs> That's true. Just shot a pink bunny. John Wick skin. But, inshallah, we're going to have a Swiss national Fortnite tournament. Inshallah, so make dua. Seriously. But, they get this question from their friends a lot. If we take the condition of taklif that someone has had to hear the message. And Imam al-Ghazali wrote an entire book on what it means to hear the message. He said, you have to be exposed to a prophetic level of immersion. So it's not just like watching TV or, you know, reading some article in Newsweek, you know, Islam, the threat of the West. Like, that doesn't count, man. But someone is like given the access to prophetic immersion. Prophetic immersion means education, concern, care, love. Right? There's a sense of belonging, mu'alafat al qulub And the hadith of the Prophet in the Sahih Muslim, the Sahaba who cared about people, he said, Ya Rasulullah, what about those Bedouins who live so far away and like way out there in the middle of nowhere? Like what's going to happen to them? Like the message never reached them. And the Prophet said to them, you know, Allah will judge them by his adab and his rahmah. So we have an axiom we say, Kufarun fi dunya wa la ya'lamu masirahum illallah. So we treat these people like, like non-Muslims, like we don't expect them to fast Ramadan, we don't make them pray Fajr. And we say their akhirah is known to Allah. Allah says, wa ma kunna mu'adhibin hatta naba'ath rasulullah. So alhamdulillah, we only took just a very brief introduction of the book. Talk about kind of the educational philosophy behind it. Tomorrow it'll be a lot more simpler. We have like, I think over a hundred something people, mashallah, have uh, enrolled with their kids and stuff and couples. It's a cool thing to do together because we challenge you to work together, have discussions. One of the things in the book says, you know, ask your father to take you to the graveyard and tell you about how he's planning to die. This is a conversation we should have with our kids. What, what am I doing to make this better for me? Not what are you doing, what am I doing? That unpacks a lot of things that can be discussed by young people. So inshallah, we will we'll start tomorrow uh, early, just to recap what we talked about. Said the first obligation is to learn, man, subhanAllah, what a religion. So now if someone starts to talk out the side of their mouth in front of you about your religion, you can say, wait a minute, I heard this classical text, right? 
is like recognized by mainstream Islam, says the first obligation is to learn. Secondly, we talked about the idea of paradox. The challenge of being a faithful person is ultimately found in admitting that there is a component of faith which is irrational. A great example is you worship God, you don't see Him. You mean in bil ghayb. It's in the Quran, a component. And then the last thing that we talked about was taklif. And we gave these examples of being responsible, right? Physically able, mentally able, emotionally and psychologically well, well off. And then having been exposed to the message properly. We'll take any questions you have for a few minutes, inshallah, that we'll, we'll call it a night. Some of us are on East Coast time. If you're interested in getting the text, by the way, it's in the back and we can sign it for you as well, inshallah. Say barakallahu feekum wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam.